like the Islamic groups in Egypt, the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, or the Nafta party in Tunisia, or the extensions of the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, in, 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 even in Iraq, or Shiite parties in Iraq. Now, since those groups were suppressed, and by suppression I mean not just closing their parties, murder, torture, and all, all sorts of br brutal oppression, these Islamists became more and more radical. <coughs> so, the, these secular dictatorships that were praised in the West as these enlightened despots actually created some of the problems which would hit the West, unfortunately, even in 9-11. I'm not saying this to justify those terrorist groups and actions, but that very radicalism had its root in the suppression of this, uh, of this, you know, of this Islamic Wait, the best example of this is in Iran. Uh, you know, Iran today, it's a theocracy. I'm certainly very critical to the Iranian regime. I hope the Green Movement will you know, flourish again and, and, and you know, challenge the theocracy in Iran and will defeat it. We will see. But let's see how Iran came to be what it is. In, uh, in Iran, like the post-Ottoman you know, uh, Turkey, there was this Shah who became the new modernizer of Iran in the 1920s. So the Shah of Iran, the father Shah, was a great fan of whom? Ataturk, Turkey's founder. So Shah visited Turkey, saw Ataturk's reforms, and he said, these are great reforms, but reforms by the way, government imposed reforms, of course. And he said, I can do even better than this in Iran. Like, and he did what? Well, he went back to Iran in 1926, and he said, the headscarf will be banned in Iran from now on. We will make old women modern by banning their right to wear a headscarf. <coughs> By the way, I think the right to wear a mini skirt and right to wear a mini scarf, sorry, right to wear a scarf, even a burqa, is all sacred for me. People do, people wear what they want to wear and the governments should not, you know, infringe with that freedom. That's, you know, we can discuss it if you want. But anyway, the Shah banned the headscarf in Iran. Iranian police started to tear whale off from women. Women hid their homes and they were like expelled from their jobs and so on. What happened? The ulema, the ayatollahs in Iran, Condemned the Shah and called him the enemy of Islam, the Yazid, you know, the uh, the enemy of faith. And a terrorist group emerged in Iran in the 30s called the Fadayani Islam, the devotees of Islam, started to assassinate Shah's men. So the oppression of the Islamic groups led to this uh, violent Islamist reaction, which is, I think, both wrong for my point. So, it, I mean, to cut the story short, there are many examples like this, but the Middle East, modern Middle East, was divided. It was haunted between this vicious cycle of secular authoritarian regimes and the Islamic groups which resist them and resist them in very wrong ways like the violence. Uh, and now with the Arab Spring, finally we are coming to a stage in the Arab countries that we are breaking this cycle and creating a room for democracy in which all groups, including the Islamic minority, including the conservatives, including the very hard Islamists, can come and learn from this you know, experience of democracy. Now Turkey was lucky. Because we were lucky to have our first free and fair elections as early as 1950. Egypt has had its first free and fair elections just a few months ago. In Turkey, this happened in 1950 because the Kemalist regime could not hold for long because of the Ottoman experience with democracy, because of the expectations of society, because we joined NATO. That was luck for Turkey instead of the Warsaw Pact and the Russian allies that most Arabs went to went to in the Cold War, and because in order to join the Western alliance, Turkey accepted uh, the, we uh, the Western system, which is called you know, democracy, and in 1950, the, the, uh, the political party, which was the first opposition party in Turkey, the Democrat Party, of, founded by Adnan Menderes, <coughs> uh, had the slogan, enough, nation has the word, and they came to power with a you know, strong uh, mandate in 1950. They won three elections in a row. A bit like the AKP of today, they did many reforms, they liberalized the economy, they, uh, they minimized the secularist oppression of Islamic groups. They did not challenge secularism per se, but they challenged the excesses of secularism, as AKP does today. They brought some Kurdish members to the parliament trying to reconcile with the Kurds. Uh, and they focused on economic development. And that's a big difference in Turkey. So in Turkey, the secularist Kemalist line has focused on cultural modernization and actually westernization, like forcing women to take their whales off, that's their goal. Uh, AKP and the center right, and the foreigners of AKP, has focused on factories, roads, you know, economic production and companies and so on, like economic technical modernization. 
Uh, so this uh, position finally had won three elections in a row from 1950 to 1960. But what happened in 1960? <coughs> there was a military coup against the Democrat Party. The generals ousted the Democrat Party to restore Kemal's principles, and they executed the prime minister and two of his ministers. So the most popular prime minister ever in Turkish history, which got 57% of the votes in 1954, was killed by none other than the Turkish military. And since then, since 1960 to today, this idea of generals defending the Kemal's principles against the majority of society is a concept. <coughs> Things changed a little bit in the 60s and 70s because of the fear of communism, but when especially communism was out of the picture, this basic dichotomy of the majority of society uh, versus the minority supported by the military power and their you know, political power has been, the, has been a constant recurring deal. And I think it is, as a Turk, I'm proud today and I'm happy today that this authoritarian, secularist, nationalist, illiberal uh, establishment has been finally defeated. Thank God without any bloodshed. Thank God with the EU process. Thank God with free and fair elections. Thank God with our integration into the global economy. So we had our spring in Turkey as well. Does it mean that Turkey today is one of them? No. I mean, we have still a lot of problems. We have still a lot of problems with our press laws. We, we are still very illiberal when it comes to you know, our laws on uh, freedom of speech and criticism of government and so on. And I admit these problems. And governments should be criticized for these problems. But they should be criticized for not reforming the system enough because all these problems come from the system, which was already there. I mean, every law in Turkey was way worse than the law back in 20 years ago. Like, for example, the government should be criticized for not ref doing enough reform on the Kurdish issue, but they have done still a lot of reforms. I mean, 10 years ago, it was legal to have Kurdish broadcasts in Turkey. Now you have state TVs and, and private uh, TVs and radios that can operate in Kurdish. <laughs> yes, they should be criticized for not moving ahead further to accepting you know, education in the in Kurdish language and so on. But I think it would be unfair today to look at the current problems and deficiencies of Turkish democracy and to say, oh, these exist because some Islamists came to power and they have changed this wonderful secular system that we used to have, which is really not the truth. So let me stop here, and maybe in the Q&A session, we'll do more. I'm sure most of you know, and like much more in, in the current events in, in, in Turkey. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Often, uh, the part of a healthy democracy is thought to be a constructive opposition. Now, um, currently the largest opposition party is the JFP, formerly in government and uh, sort of considered to be the rear end of um, the uh, deep state or inner state or whatever you would like to call it. Um, but recently a turn has been made from um, Denis Baikal to Kemal Kılıç Darulu and the party refers to itself as uh, social democratic. Um, my question is, do you think uh, the JFP is capable or will ever be capable of a constructive uh, opposition or should we uh, look to, um, well, at least one of the other two parties in government? And I think, well, they're getting it. They're, that's why they're trying to change. But in CHP, like in many other political machines, I mean, there's a reformist wing and there's a more conservative and orthodox wing. There are people who say, we have to be loyal to our founding principles, which are principles coming from a non-democratic age, principles of the 1930s. There are people who say, well, we, there's a new world out there, we have to change, we should, we should become into something like a real social democratic party. At least we should try to look like that. There's people who say that in CHP. So I hope those people will you know, more, be more dominant. So I'm supporting the change that Kulishtarolu is trying to push forward. But the problem is that, although I think Kulishtar is a better person than Dennis Baikal, to my taste, at least, uh, and I think he's trying for some change, but whether he has the vision enough for change, whether he has the political philosophy of social democracy, uh, whether he has the charisma and so on, these are not you know, a question that you can easily say yes. But we'll see. But I think CHP is in a process of transforming itself into something. 
Yet I don't still think that in the next elections in 2015 that CHP will still become a viable uh, position to, to the AKP. I hope it, it can be, because our you know, po the political system suffers from a lack of some any promising opposition. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. I'm not very optimistic, but I hope there will be some changes in the state, changes in the state. Uh, My name is Gökhan Ustoka. Uh, my question is, is a autonomous Kurdish province possible in Turkey? If not, are there other uh, possibilities? that you can advise. Okay. As for the Kurdish issue, I just want to say a few things about, add a few things on what you said. Here is a dilemma. The AKP, with all its mistakes and shortcomings, is the, still the party which has made the most reform on the Kurdish issue. And it's also the party which has the best shot to cut a deal with the Kurdish nationalist movement, which is ultimately orchestrated by the PKK. So, from a Kurdish nationalist perspective, AKP is the best thing you can get from the Turkish side. But, from the Kurdish nationalist perspective, AKP is also the biggest enemy, because AKP also gets a lot of Kurdish votes. So, it is challenging PKK's uh, authority in the Southeast, because PKK claims that it is the embodiment of the Kurdish people. It is the single party of the Kurdish national liberation movement, right? I mean, that might sound a little authoritarian to you, and it is. I mean, these national liberation movements have a problem. They ask for the freedom of the people, but they don't care about the little individuals which make the people. They think they know the best for the people. So there's a, there's a problem with PKK there, and that's why PKK's political plans in the Southeast sound very totalitarian, in which all, all the whole Kurdish society will be organized beginning with village communes to the top, you know, by PKK representative. So it's PKK try, says that it is the sole representative of the Kurdish people. Well, it is the representative of some Kurds. Pro PKK parties get six percent, five to six percent of the votes in every election. That's reality. So, but Kurds in Turkey are much more than that, at least fifty percent. And actually, more Kurds vote for AKP than the pro PKK parties like BDP right now. Mm. So, so that's so. On the one hand, AKP is the best bet the PKK can get. On the other hand, it's its biggest rival, and there's this big rivalry going on in the southeast between the more conservative Kurds generally, or Kurdish bourgeoisie, which prefer the AKP, to the more nationalist Kurds, who are more in line uh, with, with the with the PKK. And that's one, I think, vicious cycle that that poisons the process there. And it's on almost Kurdistan in the southeast. Well, again, why not? I just, I mean, there's a Kurdistan region in northern Iraq. We Turks feared that it would be the end of the world. It's not. It's, we actually have good relations with them. I hope they'll be better and better. Um, and AKP should be actually you know, congratulated for getting over that Kurdistanophobia. Well, we had a Kurdophobia anyway, but now we have a Kurdistanophobia. We've moved beyond that in northern Iraq. And why not? Uh, refer to our Southeast as Kurdistan, as the Ottomans did without any problem until the 20th century again. However, I have problems with that would-be Kurdistan, whatever that be, being, to, being dominated again by the PKK, which is, a, which is a totalitarian party which claims it is the sole embodiment of the Kurdish people. So I would like, I, I could be happy with that if the majority of the people in the Southeast support that, but I also would be concerned about the individual, about the freedoms of every individual Kurd there, some of who really don't like the PKK and don't want to live under a PKK rule. Or, you know, the, the proxies of the PKK called the KCK. Uh, about, uh, about what they are actually doing there. So my, my, my main question is to Mr. Lafayette Dyke. Is the European Union has a long-term uh, foreign policy? Any short-term as well. <laughs> long-term, or as most of us said, do they even have a short-term um, uh, foreign policy? Um, I mean, it's easy to uh, to ridiculize the uh, foreign policy of the EU because on many important issues um, there is no. Uh, EU common uh, position. Think about the Middle East, uh, about Russia, uh, and I could go on for quite a long list. Now the interesting thing is that on the uh, policies towards the Mediterranean, there seems to be one. Uh, there was one called the Barcelona process, which was not uh, very uh, successful, 
But uh, you have to give it to the EU that quite quickly after